Good afternoon and welcome for another session on uh, this uh, so useful topic like math at this summer institute. Uh, excuse me, my accent is kind of Romanian mixed with a little bit of Greek, Hebrew, and uh, English, New England accent. So. so my topic is entitled A Marriage Made in the Garden. And I will insist on the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. And I just put on this whiteboard here the geography of the book of Genesis, or the geography according to the book of Genesis. How people who wrote the book of Genesis thought about geography for the world. It was very simple. No continents, no. Just one garden here. They're surrounded by Eden in Hebrew, meaning open land. And then wilderness, and then further the sea. So this is the whole geography, you know, for the first humans, Adam and Eve, who are playing by the way the garden. So that's why our talk today is the marriage made in the garden. Uh, marriage not made in heaven, as we like to say. Uh, neither a marriage made on earth, but in the garden, between. Between perfection and imperfection, if you like. So marriage has, from the very beginning, according to the book of Genesis, two components. One is the divine component, because it was willed by God. And another component, because it was accepted by man. So this is the human component of life. And the Garden of Eden actually reflects this kind of perfection in time, I would say, of the marriage. Don't imagine that the Garden of Eden was perfection 100%. That was a perfection given to man, but to be reached in time through cooperation of God. What I have, the garden was allocated from the very beginning uh, to the humans that God made his image. Adam and Eve were placed in the garden. In the Eden, or open land, this territory was allocated to animals. When Adam transgressed the command of God, was evicted from the garden, where? Into the wilderness. The lesson is that he became almost like an animal. And then we had the wilderness. When the was allocated from the very beginning to the demons and wild spirits and evil spirits, whatever we like to call them, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, we learned that this wilderness was the habitation of Azazel, which in Hebrew means strong as God. And it's another name for Lucifer, mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter 14. And what we have a sea, in the sea, it's actually what we read in Genesis 1, 2. There was darkness, and there were some beasts called Behemoth and Leviathan in the garden. So you see, we have kind of degradation of life, you know, from the garden of humans, animals, uh, evil spirits. And then I would say the principle of evilness, this Behemoth and Leviathan. But we're going to concentrate a lot on the garden. Uh, I like to start with the assumption, which is embraced today by most of the readers and scholars of the scripture, that the scripture is, rather than a book of science, a book of stories. And stories are made by what? By metaphors. The big problem when we read the Bible is that we don't have the access, like common readers, to these metaphors. Why? Because we use translations. And translations are imperfect. So here is the role of the theologians that we have been working in this text of the Bible to recapture what? The metaphors. To go to the original texts, Hebrew and Greek. And twice in front of your own eyes, these beautiful metaphors. So what I will do today is actually to give you this text in my translation, you have the text in the handout, and to concentrate a little bit on these metaphors. The first metaphor that we are facing today when we read the first three chapters of Genesis 
is that God created humanity in time, in three steps. Unlike the animals, reptiles, birds, or whatever, when God created them in an instant, instant, when God created humanity, this is the metaphor. He created in three steps. And we have to extract the lesson. This is the role of the metaphor. To serve us lessons for life and how we have to live our own lives. And let's talk about these three steps. The first step was the humanity as a reflection or image of the triune God. Now, first we'd like, I'd like to read the text and then to tell you other stories. Um, this text is in Genesis 1, 26, 27. And it speaks about the unity and diversity of humanity. When I use the word humanity, I don't use it from a political correct uh, reason but just because I like to be very accurate, very precise. In Hebrew, we have the word Adam, which means humanity. And in Greek text, we have the word Anthropos, which matches very well this Adam, because Anthropos doesn't mean male as a gender being, but humanity, a collective word. So, okay. And God said, let us make humanity in our image according to our likeness. It shall rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle, the whole earth, and all creeping things that creep on earth. And God created humanity in his image, in the image of God he created. Male and female he created them. So imagine God as a great artist. He takes his brush and he did some strokes on his canvas. And this is the first step, the humanity. Very general word, not distinguished as genders. The Talmud, well, the Hebrew resource, says that God created humanity as an androgynous being, undistinguished as gender. But the genders were in this humanity. We have to stay away from the genderless humanity. No, humanity was not genderless. It was still undistinguished as genders. But the genders were inside of the humanity, as the genders were inside of the mind of God, when he created the first instance this humanity. To reflect what? To reflect his unity in diversity. We have a triune God, we worship the triune God. This God is one in essence and three persons. You see? Unity of the essence is only one Godhead and three persons. The same in the humanity. God wanted to reflect himself, to have a reflection on earth. So that's why the great artist said, I like to reflect his unity, and the emphasis falls on the unity in diversity. So he created this humanity, having the potential to develop in the two, if you like, genders, male and female polarity. And the second text that I chose under the first step is uh, coming from Genesis 2-7. And Yahweh God fashioned the humanity of the dust of the ground and breathed into its nostrils the breathing of life. So the humanity became a living breath. So I give you these words in Hebrew in the parenthesis. So what do I have without the second text? It speaks about humanity as a living breath of God. We ask ourselves what means the image of God? Because we hear we are created in the image of God. We hear this times and times again in churches everywhere. The humans in the entire universe, not even the angels, were created in the image of God. The angels were created as ministers in the life of God, but they were not created in the image of God. According to the scripture, only humans were created in the image of God. And we have to ask ourselves this pertinent question, what the image of God is? There are many answers, you know, given to us throughout the history, this long history of Christianity, 
And one probably the most popular answer is the image of God is the soul that we have. And that soul is actually which puts us in a relationship with God. But if we read carefully Genesis 1 and 2, we learn that even the animals receive nefesh, or receive healing with a soul. The problem is, in one way, the animals receive the soul as a possession, if you like. They possess the soul. They have the soul as a principle of life. Because soul has only animals. Only animals have soul and the humans, not the plants. Because they move around and they need a special blessing. But what is the difference between the animals and humans? With regard to the soul, animals possess, have soul. We learn this from Genesis. Uh, verse 20, uh, 24, and 30, that animals have souls. But what do we learn about them? It is in the text, Genesis 2 7. Yahweh God fashioned the humanity as a potter fashioned a vessel. And when he took the dust from the ground, the dust not the ground, not the clay, as we say sometimes to our clay with ashes and blue glasses and so forth. No, the metaphor here is that the humanity was created out of the dust. So what is the lesson of this metaphor? That we are volatile as the dust is. We don't belong to earth entirely. We don't belong to God entirely. We are like suspended, if you like, between earth and heaven. And this is our study of Psalm 8, verse 5, which asks this question, What is man? You made man less than a god, when you put him over the entire creation. So this is the paradoxical life destiny of humanity, to be detached from the earth. We are called by God to, what? to detach ourselves from earth and to progress, to proceed towards God. You see how many things we learn from metaphors. Metaphors teach us more things than even the scientific language today. Because it's so much rich as they are the metaphors. And this is the ambiguity of metaphors. The metaphors are rose and ambiguous and not clear. They don't give you 100% clear answers, but they give you what? The freedom to create in a space, and that space is a metaphor, because there is a, there is a temptation here. When you have the metaphors to ask yourself, what is beyond the metaphor? And to break the metaphors. This is a big mistake. Many people make this mistake. They look at the scripture, they take the metaphor, for example, of Genesis, the creation being done in seven days, and then they ask this question, uh, how long was a day of creation? 24 hours or whatever. So that, this is a good example of breaking the metaphor. Stop the metaphor. Ask questions. Be puzzled. Be warped in the front of this mystery that is reflected in metaphors. This is an invitation to give glory to God with these metaphors. Because he teaches us as much as we can understand and leaves us a little bit for the eternity to taste in this advancement in knowing God. So this is, the, this, this is something, but not entirely. So God created humanity out of the dust. He breathed, breathed in the nostrils of this humanity. What? His breathing of life, not his breath of life. There's a big difference between breath, if again we stay with the metaphor, or metaphorical land. Now, one is breath of life that will be part of God. We didn't get the part of life with God. We are not divine in nature. So this is the lesson, this is the approach. But what we got? We got the breathing of life from God, which means the creative action of God. God invited us to be what? Co-sharers with him in these creative actions. 
So one of the, if you like, distinguished marks of humanity, unlike the animals, if you like, is this creativity from the very beginning. The creativity. When they were naked, you know, immediately they found some leaves there in the garden. <laughs> and they used them as vestments, if you like. This is the creativity that we inherit from God. God attracted us, if you like, in this circle of creativity. And the scripture says in Genesis 2 7 that after God breathed this kind of breathing of life into the nostrils of humanity, humanity became a living breath. Forget it that those things, you know, said even in the past, the church sometimes is part or influenced by the philosophy that we are body and soul. There is nothing like this in the Bible. It's this fluidity, this dynamism. That we are actually living breath in God. The text doesn't say that humanity became a body and a soul. And a soul is a part in your body, like a bird in a cage, you know, all these kind of cocoon, you know, stories. No. The Bible speaks about the intertwining life of the body and the soul. And I consider this is very important. Why? Because for let's take an example. So we have this worship given to the remains of the saints. This explains you know, why we give this worship to the remains of the saints, because there is a kind of cohabitation of life, of the soul and the body. And only God knows you know, when life starts and ends. This kind of metaphorical energy to like response Issues that we confronted today, you know, or we can relate the life of who we should can relate the life of a person, you know, okay, it's all right. So I say no, because we don't know anything. <laughs> what the metaphor teaches us is that it's a mystery. Life is a mystery, and there is an intertwining process between soul and life. But what we became actually when God created us? The breath of God. What is the lesson? If you are a breath of God, God if I am a breath of God, if all together become breaths of God, actually we constitute what? The respiratory system of God. <laughs> this is a beautiful metaphor. God condescended here. It's the first, we talk about seeing Katavas as a big theological term, which means God descends to the level of understanding of a human person. And he goes so down, so down, till the moment that his son took the human flesh. That is the peak of Sintarabasa. A peak of condensation of God. But the first part of the condensation of God is when God decided to create a world. He sacrificed something of a potential selfishness. You know, because God, who is the, you know, the capital God, can be selfish. No? And he wanted somebody to share with him this beautiful greatest gift of all, which is the gift of existence, of being. Our God has a name, is Yahweh. Translated beautifully in Septuagint, sometimes Septuagint is translated but this time I say so well, say, oh Lord, the one who is. Our God is the one who is being. So what we have, we have that this invitation of God to become co-created with God. And also, he is like saying to us in this Genesis 2, 7, guys, I cannot live without you. I consider this is this kind of self humbleness of God. God can exist without us. But uh, as the moment that he decided to be with us, he ended up in a covenant with us. He tied himself up to some responsibilities and some duties. And he actually invited us to become part of his existence. The Apostle Paul puts it so well. We are living in God. What is this more? We learn so many lessons from just a metaphor, living breath of God. And then another, another, another lesson is that we have a great responsibility. We are not outside us. We are living in the breath of God, so we have to be a good father. <laughs> and good son, if you like, and not a bad father, you know, if we do what is against God's will. So, you see, 
There's so many things in metaphors. Now, what we learn from these actually two texts, just to sum up the, the first step, if you like, we learn that the image of God actually is not probably to be reduced to a soul or a reason, because it's a little bit of pride in that kind of affirmation or answer. I, I have something, I possess something. No, we don't possess anything. We are living bread for God. So you see the difference is between the birth to have and to be. This is the big question in the Bible. To be or to have. Animals are limited in time. And they just mean they have something they possess. But we are actually the living bread. We are invited to be as he is, the one who was, he is, and will be, the Alpha and Omega. So everything is surrounding this question, to have or to be. And in the Garden of Eden, we have another reflection of this big question, if you like, two trees. God planted two trees in the Garden of Eden. One tree was the tree of life, and he planted in the middle of the garden. To be what? To be an attraction. To be serious. To take from the tree of life. To live eternally. To live with him. And he planted also the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We don't know where. Some of their translations have both trees in the middle of the garden. A room in the synthesis of Greek, a room in the synthesis of Hebrew. There is no place allocated for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This tree was dangerous. Why? Because it could give you something to possess or to have. And more or less, this having possession could be an obstacle in the way of relationship with God. All of us will be, till the end of time, this big dilemma to have or to be. To have a long life, you know, without problems, without sicknesses, or to be just for one moment but with God for the entire life of the other. This is the big question. Now, what is the image of God? Just to sum up, I would say a cross, my friends. A cross. The image of God is a cross. It's made of what? Of a horizontal dimension and a vertical dimension. According to Genesis 1 to uh, 26, 27, we learned that we are created the name of God who made us. This is the horizontal dimension the image of the angel God. A family, a unity, in diversity of millions and millions of persons till the end of the age. This is the first dimension of the image of God. According to Genesis 1, 26, 27. Diversity or unity for life in diversity. The second dimension is the vertical dimension. Genesis 2 7 says that God created us to become what? Breasts of God. We are in this circle of life of God. God wants us person to person relationship, a personal relationship with God. This is the vertical. It's a cross. The image of God is a cross. It's a suffering. It's a suffering. Why is it suffering? Because always will be so hard to decide how much we should give to God and how much we should give to the Caesar. How much we should give to God. How much we should give to the name. There are cases where we have to make a decision. And that is actually the cross of the image of God. It is verticality and horizontality. To learn better what the image of God is, just look at what Jesus said about the commandments. He said there are two great commandments in which the entire Old Testament can be summarized. Love your God and love your neighbor. Love your God, the vertical dimension should be called, and the love your neighbor. Jesus Christ chose to be crucified. According to the law of the Old Testament, a blasphemer, and Jesus was actually accused by blasphemy, was to be stoned to death. Well, you see, even in this kind of 
punishment that God the Son of God accepted at the cross to exemplify what? That till the last moment, he bore this image of God. He was in relationship with God on the cross? Yes. He didn't curse God. Even though he had the impression, the real impression that God wanted him, he didn't, he didn't leave God alone. And he didn't leave us alone. He didn't leave his mother. No, he gave the mother the charge of John, the apostle. He also forgave everybody who crucified him. He said, Father, forgive them. Because they don't know what they do. But in the last moment, Jesus was carrying his cross. The cross of the image of God, giving love to God, the Creator, and being in this kind of kind of relationship with others. The second step, we were just getting closer and closer to that uh, marriage made with God, which will be probably two sentences at the end, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> very. <laughs> Clarifying for some people. If not, probably we're going to have questions actually at the end. But second step, the second step in this beautiful metaphor of creation, uh, humanity was shaping the face of humanity now, shaping the face of humanity. Um, I remind you that in this chapter first of the book of Genesis, God says at the end of each day of creation, except for the second day. He said, it was good. God saw what he has done, and it was good. That good is not hysterical good, it's not ethical good, I would say ontological good. God noticed that that particular fragment of creation was according to his will. And nothing which was done was against his will. At the very end of the, uh, chapter 1, God says that everything was very good was harmoniously done according to his will. Now, in chapter 2, verse 18, we can read, and Yahweh God said, it is not good. So the same God says, it is not good for humanity to be isolated. I will make for it a hell like its opposite. Now, there is a difference here in between Hebrew and Septuagint, a very important difference, I would say. In Hebrew, we have a hell like its opposite, and in Septuagint, we have a stone, which is according to him, or faith. But you see, for the first time, when God says that something didn't go well, or according to his word. It's a difficult text. It's an anomaly something if you'd like to see the paralysis. It's to teach us something. God could have done everything from the very beginning in one instant, but when he has done this kind of gradual, and again, I don't like to go wrong there. I don't know what time was between the, uh, the first step into life and the second step. But the problem is that we are created as humans in time. To teach us a lesson, to teach us a lesson that protection for humans is given in time. The great mistake of Adam was to poor or Eve, I would say in this case, on you know, Genesis 3, that she believed that Adam would be both together to life, that perfection can be reached at once. Take from that tree of knowledge of good and evil, you're going to become as God. No, God, we don't want to do this. God wanted us. To get to perfection, to the likeness of God, of the fathers who say in the church, that we are created in the image of God, but the likeness was given to us to be reached in time and only with struggle in cooperation with the grace of the power of God. So this time is another act of sin that allows us to the life of condescension of God. God self humbled and God, in this act of self-humbleness, says it is not good for humanity to be alone. He's the great artist. God is the great artist. He wanted himself to be reflected in this humanity, and he did. 
But then, out of care for us, out of love for humanity, the same God recognizes that something didn't go well according to this story because he was love. He was caring about us. He wanted us to be in a living world, not isolated like humanity there, and the entire world, you know, enjoying this uh, great gift of existence, of multiplication, of fertility, and go on. And then you have the humanity there representing a great artist. That would be a selfish act of an artist. But that is not only an artist, he's father of all. He's the father of all, and as father of all, he takes care of his children. So he didn't want this humanity to be isolated from the rest of creation. So that's why he takes his decision and says, I will make a help. He said, I, the God, love this said like this, I will make. I will make a help. And he says, help. Now for it, even in Greek, you know, but, but in, in Hebrew, you have help. Very abstract word. Help to be a helper, a person. Could be a mechanism for a while to construct something, to be a help or an assistance or something. So you see, even God uses this kind of ambiguous metaphor, metaphoric words. Why? To incite you and me to see what kind of characters we have and how we behave in relationship. So he said, he just threw this word and said, like a monologue, and Adam was there. The humanity was there. He said, it is not good for this humanity to be isolated. I will make a help to be like his boss. And then what we have? We have the humanity playing the role of God. The humanity playing the role of God. It's not the first time. We have another good example in the book of Genesis. Chapter 12, Abraham is brought from Mesopotamia by God, and God said, I will make you a father of a great nation. And then poor Abraham notices, together with his Sarah, that they are unable to have children at that age. So Abraham asks the condition of his wife, and the nice word of kind ways. He says, can I have, can I have your maid servant? And so I said, yes, of course, because I heard about the promise of God. And they like to play the role of God. He said, okay, God promises that he will make me the father of all nations, but I can participate myself. Just based on that, what I said in Genesis. <laughs> God, uh, if you like, uh, calls us to be creative. <laughs> so I said, yeah, I can do it. Why not? Yeah, he is the promise, the one who promises, and the one who delivers, I can deliver. Why not? It takes some joy with this kind of act of deliverance. <laughs> so, so anyway, so, so we have cases like this. There is a pattern. And we have our daily experiences. How many times we play the role of God? You know, if we have a bigger new family, because this is the topic of family, if you like, the husband will say, this is the way that I said, no, who I said, no, this way. We should go to Christ. As Christian family, we should go to Christ and say, let's see what Christ has to say in the Bible. Don't be God. Don't play the role of God of setting principles to me. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a pattern that we find times and times again in the Bible. Now, uh, regarding this humanity, probably the humanity can be a little bit, because we are just in a realm of metaphors, I don't go too far. Actually, we have this humanity, and probably the humanity just overheard God saying, I will make a help for this humanity. And look at what happens here. Genesis 2, 19, 20. And the anchor God formed out of ground of all wild beasts and so forth. And he brought these animals to Adam to see how Adam will call them. Calling in the Old Testament is an idiom. Exercising power. God called different things he created. So we know from this that God is a creator, and not only a creator, but a master. He has the power to call things. To what? To uh, be in charge of these things. And so, the same argument created the image of God. That's why God means all the animals in front of Adam, of this humanity, and said, okay, call them. You know, exercise your role of being my representative on earth, a kingdom. I am the king, you are the kingdom. <laughs> so, okay, 
so you might think, you know, what's the what's the exercise in the world? A few things, so this kind of is a different job. But at the same time, the humanity said, uh, my my dad bought So it's say like this: said, what what in the heavens on earth? I guess this is more difficult expression. I can't exercise my role as a representative of God. But at the same time, I can give a hand to God. God promised that He will make a help for me. I can help God making a help for me. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to find a help by myself. I know that God wants this. Why not? Give me some liberty. Like we have the book of Hosea, and I wrote a commentary on the book of Hosea, and Hosea was another eccentric guy, so I have all kind of eccentric text to work in my life. So the prophet Hosea probably know, which is the only prophet that was sent by God to make a prostitute. This is unheard in the Bible. A prophet, a holy man, and God being the one ordering him, go and make a prostitute. But you see, Hosea had a little bit of liberty, so the same with Adam. So God didn't say to which prostitute to go, <laughs> what kind of place to go. And he actually selected one by his own choice. So the same with the humanity. God said, I will make a hell. And probably the humanity said, okay, God said, but I can be a little bit more detailed and I have some liberty in choosing my own helpmate or whatever you call it. So look at what happens here. After he gave the names, he says, uh, the text says, that the, uh, as for humanity, and we have this emphatic as for humanity, this humanity found no help like its opposite. So the end of this kind of giving names, the humanity noticed that he couldn't find any help like its opposite. Now I stay a little bit with this phrase, like its opposite in Hebrew, and in Greek, fitting or according to him. The Greek translation Septuagint was done around 250 before Christ. And in some renditions of the Septuagint, we see a little bit of philosophy of that century of Alexandria, of Egypt. And um, according to the text of the Septuagint, to start with what is late, if you like, the woman is seen, regarded, if you like, like a servant, serving the needs of man according to him, feeding. Because that was the reality of the first century before Christ. Women are equal almost like animals, if you like, in the uh, Hellenized world. Now, what we have in the Hebrew, we have something more than this. It says an office. We have kinedo, the face kinedo, coming from the verb naga, which means to stand in face of another, uh, in front of another person. But like almost like in a dynamic relationship. It's not the kind of dialogue with life is and political correct things. You know, let's have a dialogue and everybody agrees with the other one. That is not a dialogue. That's why we have opposite. So what we learn from here? We learn that the woman, the human that the the female, if you like human, was created by God. Unlike the female animals, which are created only for procreation in the realm of animals, the first priority of women, and this is very important, was what? To be a biological partner, a partner of dialogue for man. Almost replacing God. Almost replacing God. Because we said that humanity was created in front of God. God was looking in the face of the humanity when he created this humanity to be living breath, to stay in this vertical relationship with him. And now we learn that God came with this idea of the second step. The step, it is not good for humanity to be isolated. I will create for this humanity a hell like its opposite, but from inside the humanity. The big mistake of this humanity, this other, was that he was looking for a help outside, in the realm of animals. And finally we have this thing he couldn't find. But this is important, that female humans are created to be a partner of dialogue with man. This is the first role. And we have the second role because Genesis 1.28 says, 
be fruitful. Multiply or deplete the earth. So we have the procreation aspect, the only one. But it's probably not the priority, according to the scripture. The priority is the woman to be a partner of dialogue with men, and that's why we have this great role of the women of the history of salvation throughout the entire history of salvation of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Women are everywhere. Mm -hmm. No? Who was actually was told by God that they would be the receptacle of the Messiah? Who was? Not Adam. Adam was quiet, was silent. All the time. Silent in good things, silent in bad things. He was very silent. You know, when the tempted to be there, Adam didn't react. Really? And then when God appeared, he was accusing his wife. If he was vocal, he was vocal just to his eyes. But who was told, actually, that will be the mother of Messiah? Eve. Now, in Genesis 3.15, we have the first of God, the first gospel, if you like, the first good news, that she will be the receptacle of the sea. Now, the man has a sea. Why do you need a woman who has sea? But just to emphasize that woman is so important in this kind of vertical relationship between God and man. Woman, the woman stands if you like, sometimes I'll say, as a concrete day by day replacement or reminder that man should be in relationship with God as he should be primarily with the woman. Now, a help from the side of the humanity God said, I will make a help for this humanity. But he didn't say where he will choose this helpmate for, for humanity. So that's why we have this misunderstanding. Humanity probably the help will be around me. But now we have the text here on the second page. A help from inside of the humanity. Just to see how paradoxically God works in this history of salvation. And one, actually, by the way, one of the most important distinguished marks of Old Testament and New Testament, reflecting that Old Testament and New Testament are inspired by God, is this kind of paradoxical, what? Paradoxical way of thinking. Meets legends. Believe me, I studied a lot. Here, <laughs> here's a little child here. Seven years ago, I talked to my daughter at Harvard. I have studied a lot of these ancient cultures. Wherever you go, everything is black and white. Do you know that only the Bible, God created humanity in three steps? Wherever you go, in my niche, the bit of my niche, uh, theology of maths in Egypt or whatever, God created one of us, humans, female and males, exactly like he does with animals. What separates the Bible from these other cultures? And uh, this is actually the reflection that the Bible is inspired in this kind of paradoxical way of thinking. So no one would have probably thought that God would create the help for humanity from inside of his humanity. <coughs> you see, we have a beautiful metaphor. God created the help for humanity from inside of humanity. It talks about what? How economic this God is. It's very economic. He doesn't think about it very well. Enough. But he wants also, it teaches us something else. That God likes or loves so much this unity of humanity. Why? Because the unity of humanity reflects the unity of our triune God. And if you like to choose between unity and God, and three persons, I would say, with the unity. Because if you emphasize too much on the persons of the Trinity, then you can have this kind of aberration that there are three gods actually, and not one God, two persons. So unity is the primary force of God. Now, if Adam was a little bit proud and uh, <laughs> self confident, now we have the little bit of lesson of humility from the part of God. In Genesis 2, 21, 22, said, we read, So Yahweh God caused a deep sleep to fall out of the humanity, and while it slept, it took one of its ribs, or sides, 
the word is very ambiguous, and close up its place with flesh. And Yahweh God fashioned the rib that he had taken from the humanity into a woman, and he brought it her to the humanity. So this is the lesson that we know, the deep sleep. The humanity was so active. So God said, okay, I saw you that old. I like you now to be used to, to a kind of law. <laughs> you you, you don't, don't mess with me. I, I, I have a plan with this creation. Leave me alone. I will take all these steps till the end, and I'll fashion, refashion the humanity up to its completion. It's my job as a creator. Then he brought this kind of deep sleep. Ecstasy. We just hear about the that the business we have. This path we have to talk about that. No, it's like in science. I have my kind of biology. It's for me. It's like in science. You verify the hypothesis. No? We 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 should verify this pattern if it works in other places. The pattern is that uh, when you mess with the works of God, God reduces you uh, to a passive element. In uh, Genesis chapter 15, Abraham was taken out of the camp by God, and God said, Look, and it says, the text says that God brought a deep sleep on Abraham. And then he had a vision about the Israelites, how the Israelites would be brought into exile, into slavery in Egypt. And the same word is used there as here, tardema, deep sleep. Because in Genesis 15, we have a good illustration of what we call the work of salvation. Here we have a good illustration of the work of creation. So there are three works, three great works in the Bible exposed. Creation, belonging to God the Father, the Creator. Salvation, belonging to God the Son. And sanctification, belonging to the Holy Spirit. But all these three works are done primarily by each of these persons of the Trinity. And God is a little bit jealous in which you should tell. That's why Abraham is reduced like the, to this passive element. You stay here, you have this vision, but this is my work of salvation. And I will do it. So the same with Adam. God said, I'll bring the sleep on you, and I'll be the way that I am. Out from inside. And here we have the word rib, the translation. Plevra in Greek, Hebrew tsela. And Hebrew tsela means uh, rib, but means also sight. And we have an interesting Talmudic interpretation. The Talmud comes almost parallel and sometimes intertwined with our holy tradition of the Father, Sikhabat. Basil the Great, other guys, the history of the church were dialoguing with rabbis of that time. So we have many similarities between the Jewish tradition of the Christian synagogue and uh, the tradition, the Christian tradition of the Christian period. So in one of these references in the Talmud, we have this interpretation that God created you from the side of humanity. You see, it's an ambiguous kind of side. It's not really, it's really a little bit smaller part. It introduces an element of inferiority for women, superiority for men, and so forth. But when you say a side, now, then, then, so woman is created from the side of humanity. Another lesson of the humanity to life from them is here in Genesis 2.23. Only after the shaping of this female Eve, man discovers his own identity. It's exactly like the first read was Eve. Why? And that man, because look at him, we have a man, undistinguished object. God takes a part from this man, to the side or the blood, and make it a woman. And then the text says, and then the humanity looked at this woman, and the humanity, the default humanity, the rest from which it was created, looks at this uh, woman and says, finally, 
That's why I put in italics here. Finally, why? Because it's a kind of reflection that he was trying before Adam or humanity to find a help. And then finally, he had it. So I said, finally, this one is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Which is nice that humanity is speaking about the one that was, uh, it has something to do with this humanity before. But what about the other that follows that? This man is like playing with God all the time. This humanity. <laughs> Look at that, he says. Now, the, the fourth part, the male now, recognizes his maleish, you know, uh, side, if you like, and says, uh, this one shall be called woman, for from man was she taken. If you look carefully, you look carefully, the whole chapter 2, there is a passage where it says that woman was taken from man. All the time we learn that woman was taken from the humanity, from the kind of poetic stuff. But this time now, man says, no, woman was taken from me. Woman was taken from me. There are different you know, interpretations. Some scholars believe that it's a kind of cover, kind of folklore, etymology here, a play on words between Ish and Isha, which means male and male. But I find a little bit of theology in uh, Kind of hideous, kind of pride of this man, you know? Uh, you know, first he wanted to deliver of that promise. Then now <laughs> God presents this woman to the man in a cordial, polite way, and says, I created her, because you are like, hmm, sleeping. <laughs> OK, but now I give you this priority. I created, but I bring it to you to give a name, almost like an animal. You see, God is very gentle with his humanity. But he is a little bit far-fetched by his pride, because he immediately says, ah, this is the woman, because I was taken from man, made from me. The one who recognizes his name after this creation of a woman says the woman was taken from man. And now God comes as a great reconciliator here on the third step of creation, and this is a little bit on how man should be right in the garden. The third step, the last one, is the creation of this mechanism, I would say, of regaining the unity. God started with creating this humanity and emphasizing on unity as the reflection of his own unity. Then, out of care, paternal care, he created Eve, that man will have a substitute, because what we learn after that, after the transgression? That, that kind of relationship between God and man was diminishing, and woman was almost like an oracular element for man getting again in touch with God. So that's why you talk about family and our responsibility within our families, you know, to pray, to pray together. Because it's a lack of power in praying together. Because this is actually the will of God to see us together. In you. And what we learn here, we learn that handsome man, if these are the words of man, handsome man leaves his father and mother and things to his wife so that they become one flesh. Something strange, especially for an ancient culture. What it says here. First we have that man, you know, saying the woman was taken from man. It's a little bit of pride. Pride. And here now, the man is the one leaving his father's house to cling to his wife. It's not the vice versa. In ancient culture, women, and sometimes even in our societies, women are going and leaving the father's house and so forth and go to ask the man. But here is the man going. So see again, probably a little bit of humility on the part of the man, you know, because you said what you said, man. Now it's the time to leave the father's house, which is to be attractive. Right now, what happens after the fall? This is the marriage made in the garden and has a divine component because God, from the beginning, intended to create this helpmate for Beth as a partner of dialogue. 
It has a human component because man is always involved in a way or another, in a conscious way or not conscious way, but involved in this process. He also recognizes that he will leave everything about and everything and going after his wife. So that's why I have this divine and human uh, components in the marriage made in the garden. But after the fall, we notice something here in the text in Genesis 3.16. This is immediately after the fall, after that transgression of the commandment of God. God appears in front of Adam, Eve, and the serpent, all these three great actors, if you like, of the fall. And he says these words now. To the woman, he said, I will make most severe your pangs in childbearing. In pain shall you bear children. Yet your burning desire shall be for your husband. As for him, he shall root over you. This is a punishment. This is the punishment from God. And you see the reverse of the situation. When God created Adam and Eve and put this mechanism of regaining the unity, the primordial of unity, man was the one leaving the father's house and longing with a burning desire, I would say, for his wife. This time now, when God introduces his punishment, the woman is the one longing is a burning desire after her man. And what she gets? This blocky, I use the word blocky. Attitude. <laughs> this kind of rude attitude from the part of man. He will rule over her. As a response for this burning desire, the word they should cut is a very, very intensive curse. It's like burning desire. Burning desire. You have a burning desire, passionate desire. Then what is the, the, the response for man? He said, you will act. You will rule. You will take advantage of the fact that you are passionate towards it. Now, in this kind of diminishing the power of, of marriage after the after the fall, I put some answers here. But before this, in Genesis 4 7, I put a note here. Both terms, burning desire and ruling, are found, but in a different, totally different context. This text, Genesis 4 7, speaks about the sin, or the evilness, or the evil spirit. Longing with a burning desire towards man. It's like he likes to kill, like Jesus said, he's a killer. So it's like longing after the man. And but God said in the text of Genesis 4 7, but man still after the fall into sin has power to overcome the sin. This is a very Intensive text from a theological point of view because it speaks about God, about that image of God that was not destroyed after the fall into sin. This is the great theological concept of our church. That after the fall into sin, the image of God was only adumbrated, shadowed, darkened, diminished in power, but not completely destroyed because God says to Cain. The sin is after you. But remember, you have the power to overcome it. You have the power to rule over it. But this is a very interesting parallel, if you like. The same words in two different contexts. Uh, and it's a great punishment, a harsh punishment on, uh, on the relationship between man and woman. I think this actually is to root a little bit and only have some time in the New Testament. And to realize that the first miracle that Jesus Christ performed was the miracle of the Cana of Galilee. According to our tradition of spirituality, Jesus Christ's mission as the Son of God in her name was to come and to restore what? The humanity. Apostle Paul put it so well in 1 Corinthians 15 45 that Jesus Christ is Eskatosada. He uses the word, the Hebrew word is in itself. Eschatos Adam, not Eschatos Anthropos, not Eschatos Amir, but Eschatos Adam. 
the last virgin of humanity. Not as we call it sometimes, Jesus Christ, we call it the new Adam. No, this is a kind of wrong in the misleading translation. Eschatos, not new. Eschatos, not new. Eschatos, Adam. The last version of humanity, designed by God from the very beginning, it was God in his own suit. Knew that Adam or the humanity was transgressed, and he designed this last humanity. He is the beginning. So now, when Jesus Christ is the head of Galilee, he performed the first miracle to remember us, to remind us probably that he came in the world to restore the humanity and his beautiful primordial unity, a step, first step of creation, of humanity. And how he shows us this? He shows us because he participated in the wedding. And the wedding, as I said, was the mechanism invented by God in the Garden of Eden. One, to keep together these two elements in a kind of constructive polarity, if I call it, or dialogue. And Jesus performed this miracle. He turned the water into wine. He said that it is time now to find another mechanism to keep this humanity in this spirit. And that mechanism was himself. That's why the Apostle Paul puts it that he is actually the Israel Saddam, the last humanity. And I give you the text, which goes parallel to what I said, and uh, one uh, 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 Galatians, actually, in chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew <coughs> nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you go back now to the text in Genesis when God said, it is not good for humanity to be alone, ask yourself this question, how this text will look, having these words, it is bad for humanity to be isolated. If God would have said this, it is bad for humanity to be isolated, there was no Raw and no room for good, for monastic, I would say. For monastics, for nuns and monks. Because God would have decided that this is the only way. Everything which is falling aside, outside of this way, being alone, is not according to his will. But the text says it is not good, it is not according to my will now that humanity being isolated. He left a little bit of room for the time of Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, everybody finds the humanity that God created. Many of the men were equal in Jesus Christ. Now, when we're looking for, you know, for our partners or our spouses, if you look around, we have this kind of uh, partners saying, you know, I have to find my half, my half. You know, my fitting half or whatever. I would say that according to the Bible, what you learn from this long, short exposition that you like to label today, we learn that actually we are in search not for our half, but for our completeness, for our unity, for that humanity we are longing for. And we just can use, you know, any daily experience, you know, that is no perfect me. Oh, you know, that when you come like this. But you know, we actually, we have elements from the other part. And we often search for this completeness. And this completeness was designed by God to be this kind of marriage. It diminished its power after the sin. Then God invented something even better. This Esachos Adam. This last version of man which is Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, in heaven, you don't need marriage at all. You have me. He will be the focal point. We look at him all together. When we find, when we discover what? That humanity that we are longing from the very beginning. Thank you very much.